Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to this virtual worship service of Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. Well, this is the world we're in in this pandemic, is it not? Computers and virtual worship, uh, video conferencing, video sharing, all these things that at least if you're my age or older, we're not so much a part of our lives before March of this year, but we're learning and we're thankful to God that we can be connected across time and space in the ways that, that we are now. Um, when you view this video, we will ha have had here at Indian Trail Presbyterian Church our first in-person worship service since all this began in March. We will have had our first outdoor worship service where some of us have will have gathered to worship God uh, in, in a way that we hope and pray and think is responsible and faithful and healthy um, as we will have distanced ourselves from one another, worn masks, and attempted to stay um, as safe as we possibly could in this time. But not all of us will have been able to gather. Some of you, and we're grateful for this, some of you will have decided that it's not safe for you to come out into public in a worship setting yet uh, because of health situations and other factors. Some of you won't be able to join us for other reasons. And so we want to continue offering these virtual worship services so that you can, even though you can't be with us in person, you can continue to be a part of the worshiping life of Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. And so welcome to this um, to this virtual worship service today. Today is Communion Sunday. We're going to have an abbreviated version of our outdoor worship service here uh, on this recording. But it is Communion Sunday, and so I would invite you, if you'd like, to pause your video if you have not already done so, and uh, gather some bread and some sort of wine or juice to share in communion with us as we worship together today. Let us worship God together. Well, last week uh, I shared with you a story from a little book called Does God Have a Big Toe? written by Rabbi Mark Gelman. And um, I really enjoyed that story. I got just a little bit of positive feedback from it. And so I wanted to share another one of those stories with our young people today and our young at heart. And uh, last week we heard a story about partners, God partnering with human beings. And this story, this week I want to read you a story uh, out of this book called Adam's Animals. You might remember uh, that God gave Adam the task in, uh, in one of the creation stories of naming the animals. Now, as I said last week, these aren't stories from the Bible. Rather, they are stories, imaginative stories about stories that we find in the Bible. And so this one's called Adam's Animals. God made and named almost everything in the world. God made and named heaven. God made and named earth. God made and named the sun and the moon and the stars and the waters. God made and named almost everything. God even made and named the first man, Adam, which means red earth, because God made the first man out of red earth. But God did not name the animals. God thought, I want Adam and Adam's children to protect and care for these animals. Maybe if I let Adam name the animals, he will get to know them better and really take care of them. Well, when Adam heard that he could name the animals, he was so happy he ran right over to a brown furry with teeth who was sleeping under a tree and yelled in its ear, I'm going to name you. The brown furry with teeth opened one eye, yawned, and went back to sleep. Well, very soon, Adam realized he didn't know what to name the brown furry with teeth. Or for that matter, what to name any of the other animals. So Adam sat down on the sleeping brown furry with teeth to think up a plan for naming the animals. And suddenly it came to him, I know I will give each animal a number. 
That way, when I want to call an animal, I can just call its number. Adam looked down at the brown furry with teeth. He lifted up its ear and he screamed, you are number one. The brown furry with teeth opened one eye, yawned, and went back to sleep. Adam spent the rest of that day numbering the animals. He gave numbers to slimy swimmers with no fins, fuzzy hoppers with twitchy noses, squeaky flyers with colored feathers, chirping swingers with curling tails, speedy crawlers with tiny feet, scaly swimmers with red eyes, and a whole bunch of gray, black, and white furries with teeth who looked like they were related to number one. In the late afternoon, somewhere between numbering the tiny sand diggers and the swarming wood eaters, Adam lost count. He plopped down again on the brown furry with teeth to think up a new plan for naming the animals. After a time, Adam decided, I will call all the animals, hey you. That way, when I need an animal, I don't have to remember the number. I only have to remember one name. Now the next day, Adam needed a big rock moved out of his way. And so he wanted the large, gray, wrinkled up, long nosed, big eared, white tusked, tree eating stomper for the job. So he yelled out, hey you, come over here and move this rock. But instead of the large gray wrinkled up, long nosed, big eared, white tusked, tree eating stomper, a rather small, quiet, noisy, banana eating, chirping swinger hopped on top of the rock and started eating a banana. Adam was quite discouraged and returned to the brown furry with teeth to think of a new plan for naming the animals. But this time, nothing came to him. Then the brown furry with teeth woke up, shook Adam into a nearby bush, growled a huge growl, looked Adam in the eye and said to him, listen to me, with all your talking, you never once thought to ask us, the animals, what we would like to be named. Now, why don't you try that? Now, I don't know what they call a skinny, hairless, red earth footwalker like you, but they call me a bear. So Adam asked all the animals what they wanted to be called. And you know what? They told him. You know, I told you last week, these stories are the kinds of stories that don't answer all the questions I have, but they, they make me think, they make me wonder. I wonder what this story would like for us to consider about our relationship with creation. I wonder what this story I wonder what it says to us about being in charge. I wonder what this story has to say to us about talking and listening. Let us pray. God, thank you for our minds, our thoughts, our wondering. We thank you that we can read your stories and even stories about your stories and know that even though they aren't exactly factual or true, these stories about your stories, like the one we just read, they do give us a chance to wonder. And so by your spirit, be with us in our wondering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to uh, turn now to our scripture reading for the day. And we're gonna be reading from the Gospel of John uh, in chapter 15, uh, but this passage we're reading is part of a much larger 
uh, passage, a much larger discourse of Jesus. In fact, this is the long discourse that Jesus has with his disciples at his last meal that he shares with them before he goes to the cross. Uh, and in John's version of this last meal, Jesus talks a, about a lot of things to the disciples. Um, he's already sat down at meal with them in chapter 13. He's already washed their feet and told them that they should go and do likewise. He's already given them a new commandment, which we're going to read uh, a second uh, version of that here in just a moment. He's given them the new commandment to love one another. He has uh, promised them that where he goes, uh, he will come and take them there, and that in his father's house there are many dwelling places, and that he goes to prepare a place for us. And now in the passage we're about to read, just before that, he's talked about being the vine and talked about us as the branches and that as we are connected to Christ, we are to bear fruit for God. And then we come to verse 9 in chapter 15, and we're going to be reading verses 9 through 17. Let us listen for a word from God. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from the Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commandments, that you love one another. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm beginning today a sermon series which I'm calling Lessons I Learned in Elementary School. I haven't decided exactly how many sermons there will be. I keep thinking of new lessons that I remember learning. But uh, it's lessons I've learned in elementary school. Now, I'm not as bright and smart as that guy who learned everything he needed to know in kindergarten. I don't remember a whole lot of lessons from kindergarten. Uh, but it took me a little longer to learn the lessons I needed to know. And, of course, we're all in truth, still learning every day of our lives. But at any rate, these are lessons I learned in elementary school. I had to go all the way up through the sixth grade uh, to collect enough lessons I remembered uh, to, to fit into a sermon series. But I did go into the sixth grade, which is where I learned this lesson. It is a humbling experience to have someone else put themselves in danger for you. It is a humbling experience to have someone put themselves in danger for you. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not going to be all that dramatic. Nobody stepped in front of a bullet. But at the time, it was a pretty big deal for me. I want to tell you a story about Tommy and Timmy. 
Tommy and Timmy, were in my class in the fourth grade. They were brothers. Um, I think, um, and they weren't twins, they, but for whatever reason, they were still in the same grade, and they were in my fourth grade class. And, um, and when I tell you the story about Tommy and Timmy, you're probably going to think this lesson could have been called Life is Just Harder for Some People. Life is just harder for some people. It just is. You see, I remember a few things about Tommy and Timmy in the, first, in the fourth grade. Now, one of the things I remember is their clothes. How old and ragged they were. And how they often wore the same thing several days in a row. Sometimes the same clothes all week long. Another thing I remember about Tommy and Timmy was that they often fell asleep in school. I don't know what their home life was like. I do remember at times hearing them talk about staying outside playing until after midnight. So I don't know if they had parents at home who didn't care. I don't know if they had maybe parents who were drug addicts and couldn't take care of them. I don't know if they... Maybe they lived with a single parent who was working second or third shift and just frankly wasn't at home to put them to bed and could not afford childcare. I have no idea what their home life was like. All I know for sure is they didn't seem to have a bedtime like I did. And the third thing I remember about Tommy and Timmy in school was how they ate at lunch. How they almost literally just inhaled their food when they sat down at the cafeteria table and how they would take anything from anybody else that they offered from their plates, a roll, green beans, a fruit cup, whatever anybody would offer them, they would take and they would just devour it. Because I presume they didn't have a lot to eat at home. Those are the things I remember about Tommy and Timmy. Now the other things I remember about the fourth grade that, that involved Tommy and Timmy and this will tell you that this lesson could have been called kids are just mean sometimes. Because I remember some of the things that people said and snickered about behind Tommy and Timmy's back. I remember things people said to their faces that were just mean. I remember the ridicule, the finger pointing, the laughing. Yeah, this lesson could have been called kids are just really mean sometimes. But this lesson is not called kids can be mean. It's not called life is just hard for some people. This lesson is called it's a humbling thing when someone puts themselves in danger for you. And it's called that not because of what happened in the fourth grade, but what happened in the sixth grade when I had an encounter with Timmy again. You see, it happened like this. In my town in the 80s, this was not the 50s or 60s. This was not uh, the time of, of the civil rights movement. It was you know, this was the 80s when we were supposed to be all enlightened. But in my town in the 80s, there were still distinct neighborhoods. Some of which you went into and some of which you didn't. And what decided whether you went into a certain neighborhood was sometimes the color of your skin. And sometimes it was not the color of your skin. It was mere economics. And, and it wasn't, they weren't hard and fast rules. I don't remember us ever talking about it. I just knew there were certain neighborhoods I didn't go into because I wasn't welcome. For example, I didn't go into the neighborhood just across the woods from where I grew up. Well, I, I went if the two brothers who grew up across the street were with me because they were bigger and stronger than, than me and most of the kids in the other neighborhood. But, but by myself, I didn't go into that neighborhood. I just knew I didn't. I wasn't welcome. Well, as it turns out, 
uh, I happened to find myself with my best friend peddling for my life through one of those neighborhoods I wasn't supposed to be in one day. You see, what happened was I was over at my best friend's house and, and we decided we wanted to go to the store to get a drink and a pack of crackers. Well, the problem is that we would have to ride our bikes through another neighborhood that we weren't supposed to be in in order to get to the store. And so as we got ready to go, we got on our bikes and my friend said to me, look, um, when we go through this neighborhood, just keep pedaling. Because sometimes the kids in that neighborhood like to jump us. So just keep pedaling. Now, actually at the time, I probably thought, yeah, right. That's not going to happen. But we got on our bikes and we started pedaling through this neighborhood. Now, as we were pedaling along, we were going up a hill uh, through the middle of this neighborhood and um, there's a park at the top of the hill. And we could see as we were climbing the hill. Now, now see, we were pedaling up the hill, right? So we couldn't pedal, but so fast. And we could see in the park that was coming up on our right, a group of kids, a big group of kids, mostly around our age, some older, some younger, but a big group of kids, and we were pedaling up the hill, and all of a sudden, I heard, get them! And I looked, and I saw this big gang of kids running toward us as fast as they could run, and we started pedaling harder. And it occurred to me pretty quickly that they had the advantage of geometry. They were going to get to us before we could pedal up that hill. And about the time that occurred to me, and about the time I was beginning to fear for my life, now was my life in danger? Probably not. Probably the worst I stood was a, a black eye and a bloody nose. But, but uh, as I at that moment began to fear for my life, I didn't, for me it was real. About that time, I heard a voice. It was the voice of Timmy. And Timmy yelled, Hey, leave him alone. I know him. That's Stephen. He's okay. Leave him alone. Hey, he's okay. Leave him alone. And I looked and I saw Timmy. And then Timmy looked straight at me with a knowing look. It wasn't a threatening look. He wasn't saying, I'm going to get you. He looked at me as if to say, listen to what I'm about to say. And he told me, get on out of here. Go, get out of here. And I did. And I pedaled as hard as I've ever pedaled. And I never looked back. Now, how much peril did Timmy put himself in for my sake? I really don't know. I don't know if he had enough of a standing in that group of kids that they were going to listen to him if he said stop. I don't know that. I don't know if maybe he took the black eye for me. No idea. I never looked back. I don't know how much peril he put himself in for my sake that day, but I know at the moment it felt like a lot. It's a humbling thing when someone puts themselves in danger for you. Which Timmy did that day to whatever extent. And frankly, I know I did not deserve it. Now, I don't remember, I don't remember ever participating in the name calling in the fourth grade. I don't ever remember doing anything mean or saying anything mean about Tommy or Timmy or to Tommy and Timmy. I don't know. I don't remember. But I know this for sure. I never stood up and said, hey, stop. I know him. He's okay. Leave him alone. 
I never did for Timmy what he did that day for me. I don't know if I ever saw Timmy or Tommy again. I have no idea what happened in their lives. But I do know that to whatever extent it was, he stood up for me. He put himself in danger for me. And it felt like it was a big deal on that day. Here is my commandment, says Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. Listen to what Jesus says. As I have loved you. Now we know because we've read the rest of the story that Jesus gets up from this meal where he gives this new commandment and he goes out where he, to, to be arrested and to willingly go to the cross for us. So how exactly has Jesus loved us? Jesus has loved us with his whole life. Jesus has loved us by doing precisely what he had just talked about, by laying down his life for us. And Jesus says, this is how you should love one another, just like I've loved you. You should love one another with your lives, by giving of yourself for each other. And so we come to this table today, this communion table, where we share the body and the blood of Christ. We come to this table today with a powerful, demanding commandment from Christ. This new commandment, which I know is a couple thousand years old now, but still has newness for us this new commandment that we should love one another just as Christ has loved us. May we be nourished at this table that we might be strengthened in the fulfillment of this commandment. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is the Lord's table, and our Lord invites all who believe and trust in him to share in this feast which he has prepared. In the Gospel of Luke, we learn that the risen Christ appeared to some of his disciples on the road when they were still trying to figure out about the empty tomb, and they didn't recognize him, and it was only after he sat at table and broke bread with them that their eyes were opened. We pray the same might be true for us today as we share in this feast which Christ has prepared that our, our eyes might be opened to how Christ connects us around this table, how Christ is present with us in the sharing of this meal, and all of this by the power of Christ's Holy Spirit. Now, this is not a Presbyterian table. It doesn't belong to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. And so, however you are worshiping with us today, we invite you, the Lord invites you to participate, all who believe in him, to participate in this meal which he has prepared. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we lift up our hearts to you and give thanks to you, O Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God. You created us in your image and you breathed life into us. You set us as stewards over your creation. You will to live in faithful relationship with us. We rebelled against you, and you clothed us with animal skins. We rebelled against each other, and you promised us protection. We went our way while you constantly called us back to your way. In the fullness of time, you came to us to live with us, to open our eyes to your will, to heal and love and forgive us, 
to die for us and be raised that we might be reconciled to you and to each other and to send the Holy Spirit to sustain, guide, correct, and transform us that we might ever move toward your kingdom. Today, Holy God, on this weekend of the national celebration of the Declaration of Independence, we find ourselves as a nation in a place we would not have even imagined only months ago. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to spread across our land and the numbers, all those numbers that we can't take our eyes off of, those numbers just keep growing and growing and growing. And now it has become even more real for us as people we know and love have positive tests and the virus has taken the life of one of our members. Our lives have also been inter interrupted by the economic shutdowns that have come with this pandemic. And about this economic crisis, we know a few things to be equally true. We know that it is necessary to, to shut our economy down to some extent to keep the virus from overwhelming our medical system. And we also know that it has led to large numbers of people with no work or with reduced income. People who can't pay their rent or their utilities or buy food for their families. We also know that the Stay-at-home orders have led to an increase in domestic violence, substance abuse, loneliness, and depression. And we also know that this new reality in which we live has presented us, your people, with an obvious call to feed, clothe, house, and love the most vulnerable neighbors among us. And now, in addition to the pandemic, we confront a new reality. Well, perhaps not a new reality, but one that we've had to come to face to face with in a new way. What we used to talk about as partisan politics or tribalism or an ideologically divided nation, you know, terms that we could throw around in the comfort of our living rooms and barbershops and coffee houses and social clubs, all of that talk has now become the active marching in the streets with cries for racial justice. The talk has become counter cries for national pride at political rallies. It has become threats and acts of violence with rocks and guns and tear gas and fires and even government vehicles. Divisive and prophetic, fearful and hopeful words are fired from keyboards on the battlefields of Facebook and Twitter. The political, ideological, theological, and literal fight for our identity and values as a nation. This, all of this, pandemic, economic crisis, ideological debate and conflict. All of this is what we bring to the table this day. And we come from a variety of different places, from a variety of polit political perspectives and theological foundations and worldviews, and we don't all agree with each other about your will and your work in any of this. But we do know three things. We know that number one, we are all your people. And we know that number two, you will for us reconciliation. Not cheap, easy reconciliation that puts blinders on and, and pretends that all is well when it's not, but you will for us the hard work of reconciliation that involves repentance and forgiveness and having our minds and our hearts broken and healed for the sake of your kingdom. And we know thirdly that you are at work in all of this. Just like you have been at work for as long as we have been your people. 
when prophets and kings fought similar battles which revealed your will and your purposes. As disciples misunderstood and debated the kingdom that you proclaimed to be at hand. As you proclaimed divine presence through incarnation, exaltation through humility, and life through death. As you have been at work in all these ways and in all times, you remain at work in our midst today. So be at work, we pray, in the blessing of this bread and cup. Be at work, we pray, in the remembrance of the breaking and the pouring. Be at work, we pray, in the gathering around this table, a table which transcends time and space and social distance. Be at work, we pray, O oh God. And come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread and after he'd given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup in the same way and he said, this cup is the new covenant. Sealed in my blood. Shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament. That you have united us in Jesus Christ. And that you've given us a taste of the kingdom meal. We shall share in the glory of your presence in the fullness of time. Now send us out to love one another as you have loved us with ourselves, with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the end of our worship service, we often have a charge and a benediction, a, 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 a charge and a blessing, if you will. I think we have received our charge, have we not? In Jesus' words to his disciples, of the new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And so with that charge, let us receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.